Let's turn over to 1 John chapter 3 is where I want to share from tonight. 1 John chapter 3. And man, there's some rich things in this chapter, but I haven't got time to go through all of this. I want to jump down to verse 16. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 16. It says, Hereby perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoso hath this world's good, and seeth his brother have need, and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? You know, it's interesting that this verse follows the previous verse about here's how we perceive the love of God, because he gave, he did something. Just think what it would have been like if God had never sent his son Jesus. And if we didn't have this example of how God was willing to become a man. You know, I can't even wrap my brain around that. But the more I think about it, it just amazes me that almighty God would leave his almightiness aside and become a man. Be limited to one spot and limited to being hungry and poor and having to walk around and, and be rejected and be, and then ultimately give his life and be killed. It's just overwhelming. And to think that God did that, but it would, he demonstrated this love. And so the next verse says that if you see your brother or sister in need and shut up the bowels of compassion from them, how dwelleth the love of God in you? In other words, that's not God's kind of love. God's kind of love has to be expressed. You know, God is love. 1 John chapter 4, verse 8 says God is love. And God has to express His love. It has to be expressed. He doesn't just love in word. He loves in deed. And it's saying that if we truly have God's kind of love, then it has to manifest itself in the way that we help other people. And then in the next verse, look at this. It says, My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed, and in truth. This is what the jollies are doing when they're helping these kids and doing things, is reaching out and demonstrating it. And then in verse 19, and hereby we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. This is what I was wanting to focus on tonight. And this is amazing to me that the scripture even says this. But it says, here's how you know that you are of the truth, and it's talking about through the demonstration of the love of God flowing through you. The way you show other people love, this is how you know that you are of the truth. And it says, and we assure our hearts before Him. Did you know that most people don't, don't understand this, don't believe this? They think that if God is really with us, if God's power is really in us, then you just know it. We depend, you know, for instance, I've used this example a lot, but if I was to ask you, are you hot or cold right now? You wouldn't have to say, well, let me pray about it and I'll come back and tell you tomorrow. You don't have to think about it. You could just instantly, right now, respond and say, yes, I'm hot or yes, I'm cold or whatever. If I said, do you have pain in your body? You instantly know you don't have to pray about it, think about it. If I was to ask you a question about your emotions and say, are you encouraged or discouraged? Are you sad or whatever? You don't have to pray about it. You just monitor these things and we just know whether we feel good, whether we feel bad, whether we're hot or cold, hungry or whatever. But when it comes to spiritual things, I think that we just kind of assume that if God was really with us, if the anointing power of God was in us, we'd know it. And that's not true. This right here is saying that you have to assure your heart that you are of the truth and that God is with you and that His love is for you. You don't have to sit there and assure yourself, I am cool, I am cool, I am not hot. You know what, you just are what you are. But in the spiritual realm, you can't perceive what's going on in the spirit realm except through the Word of God. The Word of God, at John chapter 6, verse 63, Jesus said, The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. And God's Word is how you perceive what's going on in the spirit. You can't just feel what's going on in the spirit. 
Some people will teach that. Some people teach you that you can get into a lotus position and, and go om and you get into this spiritual realm, but it's not God's spiritual realm. It's a demonic spiritual realm. I'm telling you, that's not how you access the spiritual realm. And people are always wanting to see something, hear a voice, have a vision. God does do those things, but that's not normal, natural. The vast majority of the time, you are going to have to hear the still, small voice of God, and you are going to hear God through His Word. God's Word is how you perceive what's going on in the spiritual realm. And you have to take the Word of God and assure your heart. That word there is talking about you've got to convince your heart. You've got to persuade yourself. Paul said this, I am persuaded that neither height, nor depth, nor length, nor breadth, nor anything, no creature will be able to separate us from the love of God. Romans chapter 8. He was persuaded. He persuaded himself, just like he's talking about right here. You need to persuade yourself. You need to convince yourself. You are not going to intuitively recognize the presence and the power of God with you. And you know, this really flies in the face of a lot of Pentecostalism. And I'm not against Pentecostals. I guess I are one. <laughs> I speak in tongues. I believe in power and baptism. But I'm saying that there is a lot of spirit-filled people that you can feel the presence of God. There are times that you just hit a sweet spot. I don't know what the right word for it is, but everything just comes together and man, you know God is here. And I believe in that and I've had that. I've had some awesome experiences where I've been caught up in the presence of God and I've had some wonderful things happen. But you know what? Those aren't gonna be every day. They aren't gonna be all of the time. I could unplug right here and just spend the rest of tonight showing you this from Scripture. That, you know, Elijah had a word from God come and he spoke to Ahab and then for three and a half years he just every day waited on God until the word of the Lord came and told him it was time to go have this showdown with the prophets of Baal, etc. But it was three and a half years in between recorded miraculous encounters. And some people don't understand this. That's what that whole book I was talking about, the keys to staying full of God. People are just wanting to go from miraculous experience and emotional experience to emotional experience. But the key to Christianity and maturity is learning what the Word says and just assuring your heart that God is with you. I don't care what you feel like. God has done what He said He would do. It doesn't matter what you feel like. It doesn't matter what the doctor says. It doesn't matter what the banker says. It doesn't matter what you feel like. You have to just get to a place to where you live your life based on fact and not feeling and emotion. Man, that is huge. Again, I had many people come up in this prayer line and they're just telling me how they feel. And... Uh, Anyway, I don't want to get off the subject, but this is so important, what I'm talking about. I had a woman contact me this week, and she got a miraculous deliverance. I mean, her life was totally destroyed up in Canada, and uh, she just got transformed. We gave her a scholarship. She came to our school in Toronto, and she was doing real good. And then this week, she sent me an email talking about she lost her healing. And uh, I just responded. I said, it's impossible to lose your healing. You can't lose your healing because the Bible says, Romans eleven twenty nine, the gifts and the callings of God are without repentance. God never takes anything back. I said, you didn't lose anything. You quit believing. Your body responds to what you believe. And at one time she was believing she was healed and all of a sudden all of her symptoms left. And then the symptoms came back and she quit believing that she was healed. And so they began to dominate her. And I just shared that little bit with her. We had one of our ladies at the office call her. And in 30 minutes, this woman, I just got an email today. This woman's back on top, man. I am healed. I'm set free. And you don't lose a healing. You just quit believing is what happens. You believe the wrong thing. And most people believe what they feel and what they see and what other people tell them more than they believe the Word of God. They aren't assured. Their heart isn't assured. 
it's not fully persuaded. Man, that is huge right here. Most people, they just, if God was with me, if I was really anointed, I'd know it. You expect a tingling in your hands. You expect a goose bump up and down your spine. You expect heat to flow. You want some visible thing. And, and those are what most people are looking for. I'm telling you, if you're going to walk in the power of God, you're going to have to get to where you just take what the Word of God says. For instance, Mark chapter 6, they shall lay hands, Mark 16, they shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. If you've got hands, then all you have to do is lay them on the sick and be fully persuaded and they will recover. But most people know what the Word says, but they aren't fully persuaded. And so they, if they don't feel anything, if they don't see the person fall out under the power of God, if something miraculous doesn't happen, then they aren't fully persuaded. And instead, doubt takes over and whatever you are believing, doubt is belief. It's just believing the wrong thing. It's believing the negative thing. And if you are believing that nothing has happened because you hadn't uh, seen anything or felt anything, well then you get what you believe. You got to persuade yourself and get to a point that I know that I know that I know that I've received. And I don't care what it looks like. I don't care what anybody says. I don't care what the doctor tells me. I don't care anything. I know what the Word of God says and you are fully persuaded. That's what this is talking about right here. That hereby we know we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before Him. You have to assure your heart. And then the next verse says, Beloved, or excuse me, in verse uh, 20, For if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart and knoweth all things. Boy, this is kind of the flip side to what I've just been talking about. People think if God was with us, I'd just know it. I'd automatically be assured of this. I'd know it. That's not true. This right here says your heart can condemn you, and yet God is greater than your heart. And man, I wish I had about an hour to make this point. I've got a teaching entitled The Positive Ministry of the Holy Spirit that would fit perfectly right here. But most people assume that this sense of doubt, this condemnation about, oh God, I'm not worthy and God, I haven't done everything right. They attribute that to the Holy Spirit and they think that that's the Holy Spirit making them feel that way. It's not. Your sense of doubt, your unworthiness is not from God. It's at the very least from the devil. And uh, at the, really the very worst is we condemn our own self. We just have this negative mindset to where we don't appreciate what God's doing. You know, when I was in Mobile, I was visiting with Brother Dick Braswell. He was a pastor of the church that I was at and I've known him for 30 something years. And that is one of the wildest men I've ever met in my life. <laughs> And this guy has inspired me, encouraged me. If you've ever heard my teaching on how to be a water walker, I heard Brother Dick preach that 30-something years ago, and I mooched it or pinched it off of him. Amen. I called him and asked if I could do it, and he said yes. But this guy is just powerful. And then Scotty Howard, the guy that has been with Dick for 39 years, has been pastoring the church the last five years. I was so blessed to see what they were doing. And we went out to eat. And we were visiting about things that happened to us 30, 40 years ago. And did you know, in hindsight, looking back, it was so obvious that it was God. I mean, God did miraculous things through us, supernatural things. And yet at the time, I wasn't sure. I was hoping it was God. <laughs> I was believing I heard from God, but you know what? I wasn't fully persuaded. And uh, when you look back in hindsight, man, I should have been rejoicing. We have seen awesome things happen. And I actually rejoiced more Thursday with these guys looking back than I did at the time I was going through it because I was having to deal with these doubts and wonder about, God, am I doing these things right? And Brother Dick and, and Scotty were saying the same thing. And I'm telling you that the truth is God is with us, using us, flowing in us more than any of us know, but we don't spend time persuading our heart, encouraging ourselves in the things of the Lord. 
When I first got started in the Lord, uh, I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I began to speak in tongues. I began to start preaching that we were righteous, that we were in right standing with God. And the church that I was in, man, the few scriptures that they used was all of our righteousness is like filthy rags. There is none righteous, no, not one. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And they just pound you about you sorry, ungodly thing. And for me to sit here and say that you're righteous, I mean, it would, they would have been nicer to me if I'd have committed adultery and, and stuff. But to say that you're righteous, I had people saying, that's a, the devil, this is the devil. And I mean, they were coming out against me. And my heart was telling me that I was righteous through Jesus, that my righteousness, my self-righteousness was like a filthy rag but that I was made righteous through Jesus. My heart was telling me these things, but everybody, the pastor of the church, all of the people who were much more mature in the Lord, quote unquote, than I was, were telling me that I was of the devil. And you know what? I had this struggle going on. I knew it was true, but then how could I be the only one? And I was struggling with this. And you know what I used to do? These verses right here. I used to stand in front of a mirror and I would just preach to myself. I'd look to myself eyeball to eyeball and I'd say, you are righteous through the Lord Jesus Christ. And the first time I ever said that, all the hair on the back of my neck stood up. I thought, oh God, don't strike me dead. I'm just trying to say what the Bible says. You know that Enoch, before he was translated, had this testimony that I please God. And I'd stand there and look at myself and say, Andrew, you please God. God is pleased with you. And I'd preach to myself. And you know what I was doing? I was assuring my heart. I was speaking the word of God to me. And I was trying to convince me that what I was reading in the word was true. And you don't have to do it the way I did, but you do have to convince yourself. You have to persuade yourself. You have to assure your heart and your heart will condemn you when God isn't the one who's doing that condemnation. It's like most people think God is the source of all condemnation. If you feel somehow or another terrible and don't feel confident, it must be God that has done that to you. No. No, it's your own conscience that's condemning you. And I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, it takes some effort for you to assure your heart that you are of God. It is not intuitive. It comes from the spirit realm. Everything in this natural realm is going to be telling you that you're only human. You're just natural. The doctor will say you've got cancer and everything in this world will say cancer is incurable. Cancer is is bigger than you, you're only human, and everything natural will just put you down and say cancer is bigger. There is no chance. You might as well give up. The Word of God will say, no, by the stripes of Jesus, you've been healed. The Word of God will say that Jesus is exalted above every name that is named. Cancer is a name. And you know what you have to do? You have to speak to yourself. You have to convince yourself that greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. First John chapter four, verse four. You have to convince yourself that no weapon formed against me shall prosper. But every tongue that rises against me in judgment, I shall condemn. First uh, Isaiah 54, 17. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord and their righteousness is of me. You have to convince yourself that I wish above all things that you prosper and be in health, even as your soul prospers. You aren't going to just intuitively do this. It isn't natural. It is unnatural. We live in a fallen world. We live where everything is full of unbelief. Our society is baptized in unbelief. If you haven't figured that out yet, you just aren't paying attention. I'm telling you, our world is full of unbelief and most of us are plugged into it and being told these things and it takes effort to assure your heart. You have to assure yourself that what God says is true, not what some banker says, what the lawyer says, what the doctor says, what somebody else. And it takes effort to do this. 
But then it goes on to say, you know, I just read that if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart and knoweth all things. Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then have we confidence towards God. Man, there's scripture in Hebrews chapter 10. I think it's around verse 35. Cast not away your confidence, which hath great recompense of reward. The word recompense means payback or retribution. Man, when you have confidence, that's when you start seeing things happen. There's a lot of people that will hear me or somebody else teach on, you know, all things are possible to him that believes that it's God's will for you to be well. And they will go out and they will mimic and they will say things, but their own heart is condemning them. They don't really have confidence. They're afraid. They're timid. And it's because their heart hasn't been assured. Look at this passage of scripture over in Proverbs chapter 28. I want you to see this one rather than me just quote it. This is a powerful passage. Proverbs chapter 28 and verse 1 says, The wicked flee when no man pursueth. In other words, wicked people, and this doesn't have to be just terrible bad people, but people who are not plugged into God and operating in the love of God. But if you're just normal, you know what? You'll be afraid of things that don't even exist. Some of you are thinking, oh, no, I'd never do that. Did you ever hear of the bird flu or the avian flu? Any of you ever hear of that? I was in England when that hit and they were burning chickens and things like this by the thousands. You would drive by and just smoke going up everywhere. And the mad cow disease. I literally saw piles of cows that were as tall as this ceiling in here. And you'd drive by and see cows just burning by the thousands and stuff. And I remember when that avian flu came out, I was in Scotland and I listened to the number one expert in the British healthcare system be interviewed. And they said, uh, is there a chance that this avian flu will, will mutate from birds into humans? And this guy laughed and he says, there's no question that it's going to happen. It's just a matter of how long it's going to take. He says it might be one year or two years, but one third of the world's population will die through avian flu within two years. And did you know people panicked and they started just killing these birds and doing all of these things? And did you know that it... I, I read two years later, to the, it wasn't the exact day, but it was the same month. I was back in Scotland. I read a USA Today magazine. And in that two-year period of time, there had been a total of 12 people worldwide who died from avian flu. And yet many people were just panicked. The wicked flee. People that don't know God, people that don't assure their heart, you worry about things that never happen. Did you know when the Great Recession happened? Now, I know that there's people that have been affected by that, but many of you panicked and worried, and you know what? You've survived it and lived through it and are still doing good, and yet you worried about things that never even came to pass. I just read today on the Internet that this guy, William Gray, in Fort Collins, Colorado, the National Weather Service, made his predictions about the... Uh, uh, hurricane season and he said there's only going to be three hurricanes this year and many 12 name storms but only three hurricanes it's going to be a minimal deal the last time he prophesied that is when Hurricane Katrina came through he misses it more than he makes it but most of the time it's going to be this terrible terrible hurricane season and people say well there we're just being cautious you've got to be cautious you got to prepare for the worst that's not true. Did you know when people say that, that they base insurance rates on that and people's insurance goes through the roof every time they make these negative predictions and people have paid through the nose and it hurts the economy and a lot of things happen. And I'm telling you that there's a lot of people that are terrorized by things that might never happen. There's people that worry about stuff that doesn't happen. The wicked flee when there's no man without, but the righteous 
are bold as a lion. When you understand your right standing with God, I guarantee you, it calls boldness. I'll have people come up every once in a while and say, would you please pray for me for boldness? You don't get boldness by prayer. You get boldness by understanding your righteous position. When you understand that God loves you and he doesn't love you proportional to how lovely you are, but he loves you by grace and he has just blessed you. And when you understand this and understand what God has done for you, I guarantee you it'll make you stronger than horseradish. You'll become bold. I used to be an introvert. I couldn't look at a person in the face and talk to them. But when I found out that I was righteous and when I understood that Almighty God loved me and accepted me, my timidness, my shyness left. That little book that I gave out on self-centeredness, the source of all grace, this will really bless some of you. But if you're shy, if you're timid, it's because you're a very selfish person. You are self-centered. You are thinking on yourself and you're thinking badly about yourself. You're feeling inferior to other people and you're afraid that if you open up and just start sharing that you're going to make a mistake and do something and it's fear that causes you to be timid and shy. When you understand that you are already blessed and that God loves you and you understand who you are, I guarantee you, you'll be bold as a lion. The righteous are bold as a lion. And this is talking about confidence. This is talking about you've got to take the word of God and you've got to assure yourself. You've got to speak to yourself. I feel that most Christians are just too passive. They just are sitting here thinking, God, if you love me, I would just know that you love me. And so, oh God, I don't feel your love. God, would you just pour your love out on me? And then they just sit there and wait on the love of God to come. The Bible says that you need to assure your heart. It says over in Jude chapter 1 verse 20, it says, But you, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. That's talking about praying in tongues. When you are praying in tongues, you are praying in your most holy faith. And then verse 21 says, Keep yourselves in the love of God. You keep yourself in the love of God. Don't ask God to pour his love out. If you don't feel the love of God, start speaking in tongues and keep yourself in the love of God. The Bible says Galatians 5, that the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. Those things are in your spirit. If you don't feel love, you start releasing it, stirring it up. Start speaking it to yourself. Go look in the mirror and say, God loves you. And you'll say, but I don't feel the love of God. Well, then you're wrong. Amen. Because the Bible says God loves you. God commended his love towards you in that while you were yet a sinner, Christ died for you. But I don't feel it. But the love of God is in your spirit. And you start drawing it out with your words. You start speaking it to yourself. You know, there was a time in Pritchett, Colorado, I left what little I had. I was seeing success in a church in, in Childress, Texas, and it was the most prosperous I'd ever been. We were finally seeing light at the end of the tunnel, and it wasn't another train. It looked like I was going to live and not die. And God told me to leave all of that and go to Pritchett, Colorado, a town of 144 people that was 30 miles from a town of 1,000 people. I mean, it was in the middle of nowhere. And, and there was only 10 people in the church. So I left this church that was working and things were happening to go to a town of 144, a church of, t of 10 people, and it looked like I was going to die. And after I got there, they started accusing me of terrible things. We saw a man raised from the dead and the church jumped up to 100 in attendance and the people got mad and jealous at it and they didn't want anybody but their little 10 people there. And they started criticizing me. They accused me of stealing money, which I didn't even take an offering from the church. They accused me of uh, adultery. They accused me of lying and getting drunk and doing drugs. And they just started lying and doing all of this. And Jamie was hurting over it and our kids were embarrassed by the way that they were treating us. And I remember waiting on Jamie and the boys to go to bed. 
and I was going to just go down in the basement and have myself a pity party. I'd sent out all of my invitations. All of the demons in Baca County had gathered. And I was just waiting on everybody to go to bed so I could go down there and cry and tell God how bad this was and all this stuff. And I just felt like I'd feel better if I just got into total unbelief and wallowed in it a little bit and just told myself how I felt. And while I was waiting on them to go to bed, I just flopped open my Bible and it turned to Galatians 5:22. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, and peace. And I thought, oh God, I don't want to hear that. I want to hurt. I want to be discouraged. I'll feel better if I just vent and get it all out. And I just sat there and started thinking, and the Lord started speaking to me, and he says, you're just totally in the flesh. You're going by how you feel, but in your spirit, there is perfect love, joy, peace, all of these things. And he says, if you go down there and start griping and complaining, you are going to allow all kinds of demonic stuff into you that it's going to take you weeks, maybe months to get out and pray out. You don't want to do this. And I, but I just... I felt like I owed it to myself to complain. <laughs> but anyway, in the few minutes that it was taken for Jamie and the boys to go to sleep, I knew what the Lord was speaking to me. And I went down in the basement and I didn't feel like praising God. I didn't have any joy. I was discouraged. But you know what? I knew what the Word said. And I knew that in me I had love, joy, and peace. And I started speaking it. I started saying, I will not give in to this. I am not going to go by what I feel. I am blessed. I am blessed with all spiritual blessings. And with my words, it's like you have this well down on the inside of you. And the way you draw it out is by your words and your actions. If you go to speaking how, you know, nobody loves me, everybody hates me, I'm going to eat a worm. Did you ever sing that song? I was over in Africa and I was quoting that and they used to sing that in Africa. When, <laughs> that's a lot of people around the world sing that song. But if you go to speaking that out of your mouth, it reinforces it. It shuts off the flow of the spirit man on the inside. But I started using my words like a bucket to stick down on the inside of me and draw out this love, joy, and peace. And I started confessing that, man, I am blessed. I am anointed. God is with me. He will never leave me nor forsake me. If God's for me, who can be against me? And I started speaking the word of God. And within a very short period of time, I guarantee you, I was running and jumping and happy and praising God my emotions caught up. Boy, here is a great truth. Some of you, this is going to be so simple, you're going to think this can't be true. But your emotions follow what your attention is focused on. If you're depressed, it's because you've been thinking on, speaking, meditating on depressing things. There's nothing wrong with you. I have people come all the time, would you please pray for me? I've got a chemical imbalance. I've got emotional problems and stuff. There's nothing wrong with you. It's what's wrong with you is the way you're thinking. If you think on all of the bad things that happened to you and you just constantly focus on what people have done to you and said about you and stuff like this, something would be wrong with you if you weren't depressed. Your emotions are working perfectly. They follow what you think and you're thinking on depressing things and you're depressed. You sit there and watch as the stomach turns on television and you watch people commit adultery and lie and steal and murder and you watch violence and all of this and wonder why am I depressed? There's no doubt why you're depressed. It's because you're looking at depressing things. You're listening to the bad news. Some of you were hurt 20 years ago and every day you think about what they did to you and how you've been hurt and how unjust it is and you wonder why you're still bitter. You got a choice whether you become bitter or better. It comes to what you focus your attention upon. And I know some of you are thinking, well, you don't, you, you don't have my problems. You don't have my problems. I got plenty of problems. I've got over a thousand blogs written about me as I'm of the devil. I'm the most dangerous person in America. I've got people that hate me. 
I've had people that have picketed my meetings, that have passed out books that I am of the devil and used my quotes in there and then they put all of their stuff with it. I've had people spit on me and do things to me. I've been kidnapped. I've had death threats put out and I'm not depressed. <laughs> Nobody can discourage you without your consent and cooperation. I'm not going to rent space in my mind to anybody. I don't think about what other people say. I, I focus on what Jesus has spoken to me and I assure my heart. And when I go to feeling rejection and people don't like me and oh God, did you hear what this person says? I'll go back to what Jesus said about me and I'll go to focusing on that. And I promise you, if you were to know your righteous position, you would be bold as a lion. You would be confident. You would, you would think about God Almighty loves you. Who cares what anybody else thinks about you? I had a man come up to me in Kansas City one time and he got to ragging on my wife, Jamie, and talking about the way she was dressed. And my wife always dresses nice, but she, he, was a, he was a religious person that she had makeup on. She had a gold wedding band on. And because he didn't, she didn't meet uh, his standard, he was ragging on her and telling me, you better get your wife in order and you better do this. And, Anyway, he was just telling me all this stuff and I just stopped him right in the middle and I said, who died and made you God? <laughs> and he stopped and looked at me and he says, what are you talking about? And I said, I don't care what you think. I said, who cares about your opinion? And he was just shocked. Oh, you don't care what I think? And I said, you're nobody. <laughs> I said, compared to God, you are nobody. I don't value your opinion. But there are some of you right here that if somebody was to come up to you tonight and go to criticizing you, you are, I'm saying this in love. I'm not trying to make you condemn, but you are so insecure. You have to have people affirm you constantly that if somebody came up and criticized you tonight, you'd just go home and suck your thumb all night long about, <laughs> look what this person said about me. I was walking up a mountain with a friend of mine. We were hiking Pikes Peak. And there's a mutual minister friend who loves me and hates me all at the same time. He, he's a friend, but he's always saying bad things about me. And I knew that and I'd, I've talked to him before. And anyway, we were hiking up this mountain and he said, did you hear what so-and-so said about you? And he started to tell me and I just stopped him and I said, look, I don't wanna hear it. I know that this guy criticizes me and says lots of bad things about me. I said, I don't, I don't wanna hear it. Because you know what? If you focus on that, you'll be depressed. I just didn't want to hear it. So he stopped. A few minutes later, he says, but this is what he said. And he started telling me again. And I finally stopped him and I said, I'm not listening to it. I don't want to hear. I know that this guy doesn't like me and it's okay. And after about 10 minutes, he just stopped and he says, why doesn't it bother you what he says about you? He says the same things about you that he says about me. And he says, why doesn't it bother you? And I said, because I don't value his opinion the way you do. The only people that will ever let you down are the ones that you lean upon. If you don't lean upon anybody, if you don't have to have anybody but Jesus and his opinion of you, if that's all you need, nobody can hurt you. I've had people come up to me and say, my husband said this about me and this and this, and it's bad stuff. You shouldn't be saying that to your wife. But you know what? The husband's not there. There's no point in me ministering to him. I had to minister to the one who was there and I said, you know what? Your husband could come up to me and say the exact same things to me that he says to you and it wouldn't affect me. And she said, well, you aren't married to him. You don't have to have. And I said, you are the one who is made so that you can't live without his approval. We become codependent upon other people. And I'm, I'm not saying that you shouldn't love each other and you shouldn't honor your mate, but I'm saying that you should not be so dependent upon any person
that if they don't just treat you the way that they're supposed to, that it just puts you into a tailspin. Moses, on his way down to Egypt to bring the children of Israel out of bondage, had an argument with his wife, and she got so mad she left him and took the kids and went back to her dad. And Moses just went down and brought the children of Israel out of Egypt after his marriage was split up, and he still did what God told him to do. There's many of you that couldn't do that because you just allow your heart to condemn you. I'm telling you, you've got to get to a place to where you assure your heart and you get this confidence. And if you know that God is with you, then you can run through a troop or leap over a wall. You can do anything, amen. But you've got to assure your heart and it takes some effort. And one of the things you do to assure yourself is what I was quoting earlier out of Jude chapter 1, verse 20. You've got to speak in tongues. When you speak in tongues, you know, most people don't understand this. They think it's something you just do one time to prove that you've got the Holy Ghost. And then after you do that, what's the point in speaking in tongues? When you speak in tongues, it makes zero sense to your brain. You don't know what you're saying. It says 1 Corinthians 14, 13, that your spirit prays, but your understanding is unfruitful. You don't know what you're saying. And for you to pray in tongues, your natural mind is going to tell you, this is silly. This is foolish. This is gibberish. It doesn't make any sense at all. And if you continue to speak in tongues, not just let out one phrase for 30 seconds, you know, but if you pray in tongues for an hour at a time, I can guarantee you, you are going to have to push over into the realm of faith. You are going to have to start assuring yourself and say, I don't care what my brain is telling me. The Bible says, when I pray in an unknown tongue, I edify myself. That means build up, promote spiritual growth. When I speak in tongues, my spirit is praying. That's the part of me that has the mind of Christ and knows all things. When I speak in tongues, I am praying on my most holy faith. I am, and you have to start speaking these things and you have to start assuring your heart. If you don't push into faith, you will quit speaking in tongues. It's impossible for you to pray in tongues over a long period of time and keep your mind stayed on what this person said about you and this is going wrong and what the doctor said in this pain. You are going to have to get out of the physical natural realm and you're going to have to get into faith and you're going to have to start believing God. And that's one of the reasons that speaking in tongues is so powerful. And sadly, there are people probably right here in this room that you have the gift of speaking in tongues and you are hurting in your body, in your finances, in your emotions, and you pray and beg God and you run from meeting to meeting wanting somebody to touch you and do something, and yet you, you may have gone weeks, months without speaking in tongues. You got this dynamo on the inside of you, this dynamic that all you gotta do is just turn it on and start speaking in tongues. And if you will do it over a prolonged period of time, you can encourage yourself in the Lord. Over in 1 Samuel chapter 30, David was going to be stoned to death by all of the guys that were with him because the Amalekites had come in and taken their town, had burnt everything, stolen everything of value and taken the women and children captives. And David's men were speaking of stoning him. It was a bad time. It was a bad place. And yet it says, but David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. You know what he was doing? He was assuring his heart. He was doing what these things said. He was building himself, not going by how he felt. David lost his wives, his children. He lost his house. He lost everything. For 13 years, he had, ever since God had anointed him, everything had gone bad in his life. If anybody ever had an, a, a, a right to gripe and complain, it would have been David. And yet David encouraged himself in the Lord. And he was less than 48 hours away from all of his dreams coming to pass. If he would have quit, if he would have allowed that discouragement, he would have stopped just right before he was ready to see the manifestation of all of his dreams come to pass. But praise God, he encouraged himself in the Lord. I'm telling you, you should encourage yourself in the Lord. And there's many ways of doing it. Speak the word of God and stuff, but you can pray in tongues. 
And if you pray in tongues, it forces you to get your mind stayed on God. You've got to get into faith. You can't pray in tongues over a long period of time carnally. You've got to do it in faith. It's just like flipping a switch on the Holy Spirit, turning on the Holy Spirit. Really, it's not you turning the Holy Spirit on. He's always on. It's you turning yourself on. And when you do that, man, the Holy Spirit just starts working in your life. And yet there's people right here in this room who have the Holy Spirit. And the only time you prayed in tongues a year ago, a month ago, and you can't understand why you aren't encouraged. You know, I've had so many people come to me who 20 and 30 years ago were on fire for God and we were friends and awesome things were happening. And yet now they're just in survival mode. They're barely making it and they come and I start ministering to them and man, they get built up and they say, how do you do it? How do you keep from being discouraged? I have lots of discouraging things happen to me the same as anybody. I've had, I've had a lot of bad things happen to me. I have things happen to me all the time. I'm just like anybody else. I don't know why people think ministers don't have any problem. <laughs> and if you're a minister, you got a huge target built on you and the devil is after you. I've probably, I got enough problems I could make most of you feel really good compared to me. <laughs> I got plenty of problems. But you know what? I've learned how to encourage myself in the Lord. And people come to me and how do you do it? And one of the ways, one of the big ways, I do two main things. I stay in the Word of God. I meditate in the Word. I speak the Word. And I spend a lot of time praying in tongues. And every person in here has those two things available to them. You have the Word of God and you have the ability to speak in tongues. If you don't speak in tongues, we're going to help solve that problem tonight. Amen. You can receive this. But I'm telling you, you, there is no excuse for us to be as discouraged and fearful and worried as what we are. Again, I, I'm not trying to criticize anybody, but the majority of the people I talk to tonight, they have all of these problems and they just are powerless. They believe God can do anything. That's why they're here. That's why they came to me and asked me to pray. But they don't, they don't resist. They don't fight. They just sit in there, please have mercy on me. And they aren't taking any authority. They aren't encouraged. They aren't bold. They don't have confidence. They're begging and pleading with God and then just waiting. Again, I say, if you don't feel the love of God, start turning it on. Increase it. Speak in tongues and keep yourself in the love of God. If you aren't happy, make yourself happy. Somebody said, well, that would be hypocritical. No, because in your spirit, there's love, joy, peace. It just depends on who you think is the real you. If you think this carnal self and the depression and stuff is the real you, then you would be hypocritical to act happy. But if you see yourself that you've been born again and you're a new creature in Christ, old things have passed away and all things have become new, and in your spirit, you got love, joy, and peace, then you're a hypocrite to be depressed. Amen. It just depends on who you think is the real you. Do you think this emotional part is the real you? This emotional part, man, you can't trust this carnal fleshly part of you. You know, I could come up to you tonight and lie to you and say, hey, we just got a phone call. One of your close relatives, a, a friend, a, a child or something was killed in a car wreck. And I could just lie to you and tell you these things. There's no reality to it. There's no physical, tangible reality. But if you believed it, you would start feeling fear, sadness, grief, all of these things. And there's no reality to it. Your emotions don't follow reality. They follow perception. They follow how you focus on things. And many of you only acknowledge what's going on in the physical and you don't perceive what's happening in the spiritual. In the spiritual, you're awesome. In the spiritual, God Almighty lives on the inside of you. Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. The devil is afraid of you. And yet many of you are afraid of the devil, but the truth is the devil's afraid of you. We're dying for a lack of knowledge. We don't know what the word of God says. And because of it, we have all of these fears and problems 
I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, if you're born again in here, you are a world overcomer. Amen. You are the head and not the tail. You've got more power than whatever's coming against you. Amen. Many of you know Carly Teradez down here. Her little daughter, Hannah, is the one that was healed over in England. And when they told me all of these things, they had told other ministers what was wrong with their daughter. And when they did, people just melted. And, when, and I just, you know, I'm not patting myself on the back, but by the grace of God, when they told me, I said, that's a piece of cake for Jesus. Y'all remember that in that video? And man, that just sparked faith. And compared to Jesus, nothing is a problem. Cancer is no problem. I told a couple of people back there tonight, I said, cancer is not a big deal. Leukemia, I told people, leukemia is nothing. Lupus is nothing. Rheumatoid arthritis is nothing. Some of you thought, well, that's not what I've heard. That's because you aren't listening to the word of God. I'm telling you, there is no weapon formed against us that can prosper. God is bigger. But you have to assure your heart. You have to encourage yourself in the Lord. You know what I'm doing right now? I'm doing what you should be doing. I'm trying to encourage you. I'm telling you that God is in you. I'm telling greater is he that's in you. And the problem is some people will receive this and man, you'll be fired up right now and maybe for the next 30 minutes, you'll be in faith. And then you'll go home and wash this down with doubt and unbelief, people predicting that, man, we're going to have a bad hurricane season. The economy's getting bad. And you'll just swallow all of this. And, and pretty soon you'll be right back to being as depressed and discouraged and lack of confidence as you were because you don't take the word of God. You don't speak to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs and build yourself up. And you go right back to your old lifestyle and be there. You know, you can't depend upon a service. You can't. Praise God that God has raised people up. Praise God for churches. Praise God for the things he's got. But brothers and sisters, you are going to have to mature to where you can do this stuff on your own. This whole concept of there's the clergy and you depend upon the clergy to get your prayers answered and to get things done. It's wrong. They need to help you until you can grow. But the goal should be for every one of us to be able to encourage ourselves in the Lord and assure our hearts and be fully persuaded. And we've got everything. Today with our technology, man, with the internet and CDs and things, you can take anointed uh, teaching and ministry and praise and worship. And even if you can't sing, you can turn the volume up loud enough and sing at the top of your lungs and it sounds like you, amen. And you can sing and praise God whether you are talented or not. You just do not have an excuse for being depressed and defeated. Now you got reasons, but you do not have an excuse. Nobody can make you defeated without your consent and cooperation. You empower people. You are the one that determines you have to have this person's acceptance. When the Bible says that, man, all we need is Jesus. Christ is all I need. You can, you can change. We need to be assuring our hearts. Man, that's awesome. And I'm saying this in love. I know some of you feel like, well, I'm not compassionate. I don't understand your situation. If I get down and wallow in the mire the way that you are and get the same opinion that you have, you'll never get helped. I can't become like you or I'll never be able to help you. And people say, but you just don't know how bad it is. You don't know how good it is. You're focused on all of the bad. You ought to be praising God that things are as good as they are. You know, I, I listen to the same things. All of the Christians talking about how our nation is going to hell and man, how our morals are going to pot and Colorado went to pot. And you know what? I hear all of this stuff and I could focus on that and I could be absolutely discouraged. 
But you know what? I, you can also focus on all of the good. There is no source that just reports what God is doing. But I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, I don't have the ability to quantify it, but I know by the Spirit of God that we are living in the greatest move of the Spirit of God that this world has ever seen. In just the last three or four days, we've seen blind eyes open, deaf ears open, multiple sclerosis healed, Parkinson's disease healed. We've seen hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people set free, delivered, baptized in the Holy Spirit. How many people in here right now have, like, let me first of all just point out Renee over here. Stand up, Renee. She was raised from the dead. This woman was dead for quite a while, and here's a miracle right here. Hallelujah. How many of you in here have, have seen a person raised from the dead? Raise your hand. Pastor Dean down here has seen what? Over a dozen, 10 or something. 10 people. How many people have seen somebody raised from the dead? Did you know that in all of the Bible, there are less people raised from the dead than what we have hands up in this room? There's only eight people raised from the dead in all of the Bible. And right now we had over a dozen people. And Pastor Dean's seen 10 people raised from the dead. Did you realize that this is awesome? This is more than 6,000 years of church history right here in this room. How many of you have been miraculously healed of something? You've seen God set you free. Hundreds and hundreds of people. How many of you have had God supply a financial miracle? Your finances are better than they used to be. How many of you have been delivered from dope or alcohol or some type of sexual bondage? Man, do you realize that when I grew up, it had been 2,000 years since God had done anything, amen. <laughs> God didn't do those things. That all passed away with the apostles. This is a miracle right here. I remember when, was it, uh, were you the one with me at the Omni Hotel? Daniel, the guy that did our praise and worship tonight was with me at the Omni Hotel and we rented a room about this size and we had six people show up. This is a miracle, amen. <laughs> There's some good things happening here. I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, God is moving, God is alive, but you aren't gonna hear the news talk about this. I have people come and say, if your son was raised from the dead after being dead for five hours and stripped naked and on a slab in a morgue, how come the news hadn't heard about this? Why don't you get the news to come verify? They don't wanna believe this stuff. If that was true, then it would make them wrong. They're gonna present it in some bad light and stuff. There are miracles happening every single day. There's gonna be miracles happening here tonight and you can either sit there. Amen. And you can either sit there and be skeptical and doubt it and you know, I've had people come up before and say, did you get a doctor to confirm that your son was dead? <laughs> well, as a matter of fact, I did. They did pronounce him dead and put him in a morgue. But well, where's the piece of paper and all this? And I, I tell people, I say, you know what? Jesus didn't have anybody confirm that Lazarus was dead. There's just people that they aren't gonna believe even if a miracle happens in front of them, they're gonna sit there and say, I don't think that person was that bad off. It must have been psychosomatic. It wasn't real. There's some of you that don't, you know, um, who was it? Peter, after he heard about the resurrection of Jesus, unless I, or no, it was Thomas, unless I can see in his hands the print of the nails unless I put my finger into the print of the nails, unless I thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. That was a choice. And I guarantee you there's people that will not believe. Even though you saw somebody rose, rise from the dead. You know, when my son was raised from the dead, dead for five hours, I've seen three people personally raised from the dead. My son was dead for five hours and I took him home. He was just as normal 
as he was before. Dead for five hours, no brain damage, no more than before. And later that day, it was so normal. He was so normal. He was joking and cracking jokes that honestly, I had to sit here and assure my heart that he came back from the dead. This boy was dead. It was just so natural. You know, you would like to see fireworks. You would like to see an angel fly by or some, you know, you'd like to, see, but it was just normal. The first guy I ever saw raised from the dead, I walked in, the sheriff was trying to get his stuff out. He had never done this. He was in that town of 144 people. He had never seen a dead person. He was trying to get his stuff out and he was shaking so bad he couldn't do it. And I just walked in. I didn't know that the guy was dead until I heard his wife say, oh God, bring Everett back from the dead. And when she said that, it's the first time I knew. And I just said, Everett, come back into that body. And he just sat up and looked at me. And and I had to think, was he really dead? Maybe he was just laying there and asleep, but he fooled the, the sheriff. He fooled her. You know what? Your mind, you just, you have to assure yourself, yes. Yes, that person was healed. Yes, this is a miracle. In the name of Jesus, I believe that when I lay hands on people, things happen. And people have come along, well, did you get it verified by the doctor? And you know what? If you fall for that and start saying, well, I'm not going to believe that this was really God until I get a doctor to confirm it or something, then you aren't going to be strong in faith. I guarantee you they got a mindset against this. They don't want to believe this. You know, when my son was raised from the dead, they had stripped him naked, put him in a, uh, on a slab in the morgue, had a toe tag on him. You don't put toe tags on people until they're dead. But I asked that doctor twice. I said, so was he dead? He says, nobody leaves this place the way he is right now walking unless God does a miracle. And so then he talked for a while and I said, so was he dead? He says, nobody could come out of here. And he wouldn't say he was dead because you know what? If he did, there's a liability issue. But later on, we had our students uh, in the hospital, in that same hospital, praying for people. And uh, a nurse walked in and they said, look, we hadn't got time to explain. We got to pray in tongues. And she said, oh, don't bother me. I, this is where... Peter Womack was raised from the dead. We know what you're doing. So uh, they know what's going on. I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, most of us know more than what we are operating in. And it's because we don't assure ourselves. We let the skepticism and the unbelief of this world pull us down and you can justify it and put different names on it, but it's just unbelief. We let unbelief make us afraid. We're afraid to stand up and tell people what we believe because somebody might not understand. They might criticize us for being weird. The way I look at it is they're weird. I'm normal. Amen. It's normal to love God. It's normal to lay hands on the sick and see them recover. We had the previous prayer mayor of Woodland Park where we've built our Bible college and he told the newspaper, he says, we don't need these kind of people in our town because they believe that you can lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Yeah. 